My name is Christian Walter. I'm a fish ecologist working at the Institute of Freshwater Ecology and Inland Fisheries in Berlin. And in my talk, I will give you a brief uh, introduction into the biological assessment methods. So the aim of this lecture is primarily that you get an overview what can be measured, which taxa can be assessed, also, and how we do it. Also. So I will give you some indicator species, some indicator taxa, uh, metrics that can be measured also. I will introduce the application of suitable methods also, but all of that I will really stick to the basics, how to do it also, what has to be considered. Uh, it, this lecture will not replace the local expert also skills and experience also in species identification and all these things. Also, these are still necessary. Also, uh, when, when we start with, we, we are talking about degradation, the regulation of river system, the transformation from a river in that hydromorphological state to an regulated state, or the other way back, we rehabilitate stretches also, starting from the degraded situation also to a more, in our view, more improved situation. And the question is always uh, what has been lost in habitat futures also, what was gained and what should be measured to detect the response of the biology to these changes in, in both directions. Uh, either we improve the situation from our perspective or we uh, degrade the situation also. And when we go to the basics, what really changed or so during this transformation, it's always a loss or, or gain of literal habitats, of habitat diversity and habitat complexity, also depth and wealth variability, changes in flow velocities, getting more uniform or on the other way around, getting more complex or so, lateral connectivity and also the floodplains. They are lost and gained. And the question is, who might respond also? And here it's very simple to see these are the habitats which are lost or changed, modified or so, and there are organisms bound to these habitats also where they are. And for example, in the river margins also, it's in particular the riparian vegetation, and therefore the littoral is also so important. The depths where the light can penetrate into the water and reach the bottom. That's the area where plants can root and, and grow. So aquatic plants are quite important. Also juvenile fish depend on these shallow habitats for nurseries also. So they may respond to our activities. We have floodplain water bodies. There are still also fish in, plants in and macroinvertebrates that can be measured. Macroinvertebrates are also in the main channel in the water, also adult fish. And we are much too often focused on the quality elements of the Water Framework Directive because the implementation of the Water Framework Directive is at the moment dominating these rehabilitation efforts. But there are other organisms like carabid beetles which are in particular also depending on such pioneer habitats there, where really functions, uh, river functions are also ex exerted here also or in swampy habitats also. Why not measure those species also? It's not necessary that there are quality elements for the Water Framework Directive. In particular, it's important that there are quality elements showing you changes in the habitat, what you want to measure. The same is with floodplain vegetation also, not an obligatory water qu framework quality element, but quite important for the river functioning. And I still start with the floodplain vegetation, how to measure it. First of all, during the vegetation period, when plants are green, flowering in the summer months, also then it's the best time to assess them and what we are typically doing, we are laying transects uh, through the floodplain. So, and that is rather basic, not only for the plants or so, we typically do a stratified sampling. 
also not randomly going out in the field and by accident also measuring and sampling our places of interest. We are primarily searching for the habitats we want to assess, the things we want to compare and then stratify our sampling accordingly. So here typically if you have um, rivers which are smaller than 50 meters in width or so, 200 meters are sufficient. Also if you have larger rivers you take 500 meter sections and then you put a transect every 100 meter or so and then you measure the vegetation along this transect simply the, the length of all these vegetation stretches along the transect here, the immediate riparian vegetation, other vegetation types, and to, you record it, and also the dominant species or so. Later on, you stratify your transects in subzones in regular distances or so. So if the floodplain is 300 meters wide, you have 100 meter subzones. Is it only 30 meters wide? You have 10 meter subzones or so. And then for the more detailed analysis, you can then have plots along your subzones. And 12, in this case here, along the transect. The thing is, you have in the subzone one, which is closer to the river system, to the river bank or so, you have more samples than in the subzone two and in the subzone three or so. The idea behind this that in the farther stretches of the floodplain, the turnover, the changes are not that fast, the variability is not that high, that you have to have more sample. And this gives you also an impression of the riparian, the immediate riparian vegetation. Also, so you can use it also as that. These plots are meter by meter. Also, so having one square meter, we are re really exactly determine the plant species there and the, the proportional composition of the plants in these areas also. And that we are doing for all these transects also, and you have an overview of these um, uh, vegetation composition in the different zones. And along these transects, these squares are distributed randomly in the respective subzone also, which covers also the natural variability which is still there. It's not, not every plot is, plot is the same or so. And here you get then along a transect a group of plots here which show you then the whole variability and species composition of the riparian vegetation along the banks also and further distant from your area also. Uh, along the transect, the vegetation communities are typically recorded and the dominant species and within the transect, the proportional composition. And what is also quite important really to note the length and to work here with square meters. I will, except one, with one exception, I will show you only methods which are called active methods you are going to the organisms, to the plants, and measure where they are and relate it to length or to area. It is quite important to have later on the chance to have density estimations related to areas or to lengths. Also, then you can standardize your sample by area or by length, and you compare it with numerous other samples which have a similar approach even if they measure squares 10 by 10 meters or so, or a kilometer in a floodplain, you can always standardize it to 100 meter stretches, to 10 meter stretches, to the square meter, and then really compare densities. Without this information, you can't do it. Also, you have 50% of plants from a certain species in a certain density. Yeah. One guy has sampled two kilometers, without noting is the other only 100 meters or so, you cannot compare it without this information. So active methods, always the standardization. Also, you do it for all these transects. Uh, riparian vegetation, you can, there are also other approaches to sample riparian vegetation where you not consider the whole floodplain vegetation or even if there is no floodplain, 
you simply consider the river margins and use 100 meter stretches and then the same procedure you assess the proportional cover of the plant species, the dominant plant species within these 100 meter sections. The advantage of this method is you can roughly work for the communities even with aerial photographs and these 100 meter stretches along the river system you can easily work also, also over several kilometers or so. It's a rather fast method and even here if you needed the information more in detail, if this more in your focus or so, then you use as well these meter by meter plots or so for the specific determination of the plant composition, always going back to species at species level, determine the plants at the species level, note the species also. Try as much as possible with all taxa to go back to the species level. Even ecological knowledge is improving all the time and if you have a species later on interesting life cycle uh, characteristics might become discovered also which have not been used for example as indicator at the time of sampling you can later on add on this also you have the species list you have the species density per square meter and it enables you if you have these species that you can really later on also work with this list. Aquatic vegetation. These are the plants which are also of interest for the water framework directive. These are a direct biological quality element. We have to distinguish here two groups. The hydrophytes. These are all plants which are submerged in the water. Both are so the hydrophytes are primarily aquatic plants submerged in the water or with floating leaves. So they root in the water. And the second group are the halophytes. They are on the transition zones between the aquatic habitat and the bank habitat. So classical halophyte is the reed belt. And because these transition zone and the dynamics of these transition zone this is reflected in the water level dynamics. This is also an important process, in particular for plant growth. We especially assess also this transition zone starting, depending on the turbidity of the water, um, round about uh, in the water at the depth level, typical in half a meter depth, also where plants start to grow and then align it that you have one transect parallel to the bank underwater where they start rooting, one in the transition zone and one uh, above the mean water level so that you have also this transition and the change in the plant community in this transition zone which indicates you also the, the fluctuation in the water level, the dynamic in the water level as a physical process and even here we typically um, identify the species and working with the proportional cover then of species in this area respectively with the number uh, counted along a hundred meter stretch or so to have also densities. Um, apart from the bank in the deeper channel or so they are typically two strategies to sample aquatic macrophytes in the channel, what you can see here. Uh, it's easy in wadeable rivers. If you need a boat, it becomes a little bit more tricky. But you typically take a 200, predefined 200 meter stretch of the river where you follow in a zigzag course, also the aquatic macrophytes or so. And along this course, also, you note and measure the abund <coughs> abundance of the species so as the percentage of cover, also the height in the water column, which is quite important, whether or not they reach the surface or not, and you note the species and the growth form of these aquatic macrophytes. Also, and the second approach to do so is just also taking transects, for example, one meter transects over the whole stretch or so and where you do 
principally the same. You measure the density or the, the cover uh, of aquatic macrophytes and also the growth, the, the height within the water column. And then you identify it to a species, what are the dominant species therein. Going back from, uh, away from the plants, coming to the riparian beetles, as a non-water framework directive, uh, biological element, which is quite important and quite indicative for the dynamics also in the water level along the banks. Also, also here you need a stratified sampling, predefined habitats in a way that you have the amount of open water, uh, of open uh, surface habitats and habitats with a little bit more uh, vegetation, a little bit more complexer because they require two different sampling approaches and also very important, you should not be farther away from than 10 meters from the water line here. The riparian beetles are typical in a stretch in maximum 10 meter distance from the bank, rather narrower, so it makes no sense if you see the river somewhere in the back and try to find riparian beetles there. They will not be there for sure. Um, here you make a pre-classification of the available habitats in about 10% cover steps or so, and then you distribute your sample according to the main habitats. It's a kind of multi-habitat sampling there. Means in this case, for example, 60% of my 200 meter stretch are sand and 40% are grass or so. That means six samples are on sand and four samples are in the grassland. Also every 10% habitat or so, one sample. Uh, if there are structures, habitats or so, which are below 10% cover at all, you will not consider it for this sampling. And here on the, on the bar soils or so, Typically, the hand collection, where you use uh, nets or exhausters also, and that it's quite helpful if you take a little bit water and water this area, what you want to sample, because these riparian beetles, they depend on, on food stuff immediately on the water line also, and they're moving with the water forward and back also, and putting here something, a bunch of water also, brings them in movement and you see them immediately and can catch them. Um, in this more structured habitat, we use pit trap folds. These are typically sampling containers which are buried so that the opening is on the same level than the surrounding surface. And they are typically, they are, they are filled with the Renner solution that is a kind of solution which kills and preserves the animals also and they are typically exposed for a week and that's tricky you have to have a look on the on the dynamics and you have to during the sampling also to care a little bit about the weather because if they are too close to the bank and it's raining the water level is rising, uh, rising they are flushed away, your animals which have been trapped so far also. And for the same reason, they are typically also constructed with a small roof. You can use a petri dish, half a petri dish as a roof, what you put over. Don't use the, the original uh, cap also, because if it's black, you influence your sample. The light cannot penetrate or so, and you create a shadow, and this can attract or disturb individuals to move in also. So use a petri dish and then you can cover it also. So you have, with this sampling, you have to account for, for rain and also for water level fluctuation. It should be not too short. And that's the only passive method I have to recommend you because there's no other one. What is sampling also? Passive in a case, I built a trap and I depend on the movement of the beetles that they are trapped there. I cannot influence it. And if they are really in motion, they can come from 10 meters away. And if not, they sit half a meter next to my trap and are not trapped. 
That's, that's the problem with this passive method. Therefore, in most cases, we go for active method whenever it's possible, also active method, because they allow really the relation to the habitat, what is sample to the amount of habitat. Macroinvertebrates, there's, that's really a standard method. That's the, the group which is uh, for the longest time really in use for environmental assessment and water quality assessment. The basic idea here is also the multi-habitat sampling that within a river stretch of 200 meter length, you first stratify the habitat. So, so what is available as habitat here, low flow zones with probably an organic material, here higher flowing zone with probably ripple, you have wood here or so. Then you estimate also the percentage coverage uh, in your 200 meter stretch or so. And then for in 5% steps here, other than the riparian beetles where we typically use 10% cover, here only 5% cover, so it's more detailed and 20 samples are put within these uh, 200 meter stretch according to the amount of habitats. So then a habitat which covers 60% of your stretch or so gets 12 samples. In this multi-habitat sample, a habitat which covers only 5% get one sample and a habitat below 5% gets no sample or so. And by that you distribute 20 samples in this area according to the available habitat or so. And you can use the kick sampling as it's shown here. So 25 by 25 centimeters, these are typically the plots. You take all together, you have a little bit more than a square meter sampled. Sounds not much. There are so many organisms in that the post-processing is typically a very long process and needs subsampling also. And what you see here also, what you can do in the field or have to do in the field, remove all larger organisms. So large mussels are taken out before because they can be easily identified in the field. There's no need to preserve them and take them back to the laboratory also. And stones have to be cleaned, wood has to be cleaned also. And that you take only the organisms and in particular the small organism, which you have to determine in the lab. And even there, and also it's much more complicated, you should go at best to the species level. And there are a lot of groups where the, the family level or so is, is the lowest useful taxonomic level or so because it's then too complicated and too time consuming to identify certain groups to a species level. But try to go as much as possible to the lowest um, taxonomic level. It's even worse to try to go as much as possible to the species level because this always gives you later on uh, the possibility to add in particular on the species also trade data and analyze these. And here also with these 20 samples on a certain area you have this relation, this active relation to the area sampled. You can compare samples always according to the area sample. Now we come to, to my favorite the fish sampling, also the, the standard gear is the electric fishing because it can be used nearly in every substrate. Also you induce an electric field in the water, this is round about five meter in diameter. Fish get stunned in the electric field, also can be taken by a separate dip net also and then they recover immediately when they are out of the electric field. You can measure them, you can release them, um, and you can in particular fish also very structured habitats, also in complex habitats. We don't have the chance with other gears, with nettings for example, uh, to collect the fish there because of the obstacles or so, and, and it's also uh, the, the less harmful method for, for the fish itself because it gets only very few contact with nets. It's only the dip net when you take them out. Also, typically, the fishing is single pass without any stop net. It means you fish upstream in an upstream direction. And I did not mention that with, for the other groups, 
we always work in an upstream direction for all kinds of sampling because if you disturb something in the river along the river, river margin or so, the flow takes the effects, turbidity, sediment or so, always downstream, the same here. And if you cannot wait in the river, then you have to use a boat. Also, and even here we stratify the sampling according to the available habitat in floodplain water bodies along such erosion paths or along the groin fields. You have to accept or expect a certain difference in the fish assemblage composition also and therefore also for fish like for the other uh, organisms we try to separate the habitats because the point is later on if you fish all together and analyze fish all together you never remember where you caught a specific species or so and in particular with time you always forget it and here if you separate it you have always the chance later on to see also certain relation to specific habitats because that's always the intention behind we try to relate these things to habitat to habitat structures that means you have to separate it also you have also to separately sample it so that we always try to stratify our sampling according to the main habitats and then fish the habitats and then uh, register the catches separately for those habitats. And here also with the determination goes to the species level. And if you work in large rivers, also the open water uh, habitat, the mid-channel section, is still a specific habitat which needs other sampling methods. Here, for example, trawling to get the fish which are in particular inhabiting this habitat. So for all this sampling, you have to be very clear in your sampling objectives. If you do species inventories, if you are interested in biodiversity also, then the principal thing is to cover as much as possible habitat and to cover also as much as possible seasons also because there are changes in the species composition according to season also spawning season, emerging seasons, also it will always influence your, inf your species you get at a specific point. They have seasonal and ontogenetic habitat shifts or so, so where they are caught. So it means a lot of sampling and it means also a lot of species identification because for biodiversity you are not satisfied with the family level or so, you are interested in getting as much as possible species or so and what is still there. The advantage, the other way around is you do not depend only on this um, stratified sampling or so. You can use all kinds of reliable information. So if fish, for example, are not appear in your electric fishing, but you see that an angler catch it, also you have the qualitative information that this species is there and it's reliable. It's, you still have evidence. He caught it in the river, so this species, yes, it lives there and was most probably not the last one also. So you can use this kind of information. If you are interested in abundance trends of specific species, you don't have to sample the whole community. It's sufficient to sample your species of interest also, or the group of interest, but the point is with the uh, trends, you need a timeline. Over time, in a standardized way, also sample your group, your age class of interest, your species of interest, and then you will ch see changes in time. And what we are in particular trying to do is this environmental assessment, also the assessment of specific habitat improvements or habitat degradation, and there, it's important to sample your indicator taxa, your indicator species, sample as much as possible, what can show you the differences, and here in particular also the sampling design. Before, after, and then control impact. That is 
quite important because that's the only way where you can really distinguish the effect from a rehabilitation measure, for example, from the natural variability. You have to define before or in the phase of the project planning where is the area or the river stretch where the measure should be implemented and then you try to find a rather similar stretch also where no measure will be implemented. And in the beforehand you have to sample both stretches, the stretches where the measure is planned and the control stretch also. And later on, if the measure is implemented, then you also sample both stretches again, the river stretch now with the implementation of the measure and the control stretch in the same year, in the same time. Why is it important? You see from the change of the control in time also which amount of change in the community, what you observed is natural variability, which changed even on that side where no measure was been taken, and what is probably due to your measure. Also, from this difference in between these stretch, you can estimate what might be the effect of the measure. So the, the difference between the change in the control side in time and the difference between the change and the planet or the status of the site before and after your measure in the same time span. So that gives you a feeling uh, for the effect. And this sampling design also required to, <coughs> requires to keep all other potential influences rather similar means if you sample a control stretch and a measure stretch, do it at the same day if possible in the same time because rivers are dynamic systems also and if you do one side one day the other side the other day there might be a thunderstorm overnight or so there might be something else also which also hampers the comparability between these two sides so things you will compare in nature try to sample as closely as possible together to have a rather uninfluenced assessment. Uh, coming to the specific uh, assessment methods, also in particular for the Water Framework Directive for these biological quality elements, also there are 21 different methods uh, assessing macrophytes, aquatic macrophytes, so nearly every member state has its own method, but they all stick to the um, obligatory questions uh, or matrix given by the Water Framework Directive, abundance, biomass, species composition, diversity, and the growth forms for the macrophytes, for the benthic invertebrates, even more assessment schemes are in use also, same matrix, abundance, biomass, composition, diversity, and also for fish, 20 different assessment systems or so, abundance, biomass, composition, diversity, and here in difference to the others, age structure as indication for natural reproduction. Also, and I will only go very briefly um, to some basic uh, relationships or so, which underlay this indicator idea also. And biomass and abundance, it was nearly in all assessment systems there. If you see here in particular the response of this is mainly to water quality. We should not underestimate it also when we try to use these metrics also for hydromorphology. Uh, water quality in particular at a scale from oligotrophic to hypertrophic means increase of nutrients per se increase of nutrients is not bad. And, and many communities are responding positively, in particular related to biomass. Also, the biomass typically increases if there's more nutrients available also. And it's not only a human fault as this happens also, also in nature. The, the thing is, along this chain, the species composition and the species contributing to this biomass are changing 
So therefore, it's important to have also the species. Also, there are a few which are more um, intolerant against uh, high, too high nutrient levels. Also, and so here will be a shift in the species in the species abundance along this curve. And this is the reg original specificity of this indicator that has been has to be defined for your uh, specific metric set then. Here is no general advice possible or so. The only thing what also happened or so um, with increasing nutrient load in particular then in the, if it's too high in the hypertrophic or so, the water is often too turbid or so that submerged macrophytes grow. There's often not enough light for them to germinate or so, so that later on in the high eutrophic states, we have in particular uh, emergent plants there. Benthic invertebrates are able to produce much higher biomass until they collapse. At the end, all these communities collapse because they get an oxygen problem. Also, if the respiration is too high, also during the night, uh, that it can be not um, substituted by mechanical oxygen input or plant uh, photosynthesis also then the communities will collapse. But here also the biomass at that peak is formed by different species than here also. Here are uh, species with high oxygen requirements typically, while to the end we find mass development of species with lower oxygen requirements. And the same as with fish, we have shifts in fish communities the biomass in general goes up at the end, but we have a shift in dominant species from the corrigonid fish to the cypronid fish, which are typically able to tolerate higher oxygen uh, depletion. Also, and another point where really habitat complexity uh, plays a role is the diversity of species more complex habitats uh, support more species and a higher diverse community. That's also reflected in the species composition. More habitats serve more species also, and also in the age structure of fish, because there we have also uh, different um, abilities to withstand, for example, flow velocities also, and complex habitats provide a wider variety of flow velocities of shear forces also and therefore also a wider age structures and for the plants in particular for the growth forms and that's an important point why the growth forms of plants are in there also if you have linear very linear long leaves also they can resist even higher flow velocities while very fragile growth structures where the main stem has still branches with leaves also, they are quite fragile and they do not withstand uh, even moderate flow velocities. Also, and this is shown here in this figure where we have the tolerance against high flows. Also, aquatic plants, the highest diversity you will get in, uh, in flow velocities up to 0.3 meters per second also and then in higher flow velocities, higher shear forces, they will disappear. Also, benthic invertebrates, the flow preferences, still water preferring individuals to tolerate much less flow velocity than rheophilic or rheobiont uh, individuals, which can go up to more than two meter per second twist, then they have specific facilities or specific uh, structures and also behaviors to withstand these high flow velocities. And the same with fish, what I mentioned already, larvae are drifted away at rather low flow velocities. And then with increasing swimming performance of the fish with increasing size, they're able to withstand uh, higher flow velocities. And the gap quite often occurs in the regulated rivers or so where we have a rather uniform flow and a rather uniform flow velocity also and no place where the larvae can grow until this size that they can withstand these higher flow velocities also. That is 
the problem here. And to be more specifically, and just going uh, into a few trades. Also, if you have a higher discharge, the process is the flowing water driving the sediment transport and sediment sorting process. Also, this is clearly a hydromorphologic process, or these are hydromorphologic processes. They, in particular, support gravel spawning species. Also, and here you have specific indicators. And here it's the trait, in particular the trait, which plays a role independent of, of the species itself. Gravel spawning is a life history trait which depends on gravel and is thus also an indicator for this gravel sorting that it's there. And yeah, you, have, you can still use this trait and the abundance of species with those traits also, and it indicates that there's certain process. Another uh, potential indicator is based in the mobility of fish. Uh, fish are able to utilize the different habitats for spawning, for juvenile growth or so in a larger area because they are mobile. And it turned out already 100 years ago that they are quite characteristic for certain river region, from the trout region, over the bream region, barbel region, bream region, also, and this can be also used for such an indication. Also, the certain species prefer that's given here in this uh, species character value and this index also prefer certain river region, so that also the composition of these species can be used to show whether the sample is more typical for such a reach or for such a reach or so, and then compared with your target what you develop for the river system or so, you can then use also these character uh, to assess it. But this is still not to replace, this lecture is not to replace the experts in the field. Um, the use of these indicators, the interpretation of these indicators should be done always by experts for the different taxonomic groups. But to, to wrap up these things, also you have to be very clear in your sampling objectives, choose the right indicators you want to have also, and then use a strat sampling strategy that is an active one, that you always can go uh, and relate your findings to a certain stretch. And if it's related to a certain stretch, whatever you choose for an analysis method later on or so, you can always standardize it by the total amount of fish uh, area or of sampled area or so. You can always standardize it and then you can compare it with quite different regions um, of Europe or so, of the country or so. And the same is with the traits. The important character of a trait is that it gives or it stands for a certain life history character independent of the species. So different species of the same trait behave similarly uh, for this specific trait, for this specific habitat requirement. So trait-based metrics are also comparable among systems or so. That's quite important. Yeah, and the sampling size, the sites, the only thing, always have a reference also that you are able to compare reference with measures and also the change on the reference site in time with the change of the before and after of your measure sites that you can distinguish natural variability from really from your improvements also. And have in mind, even if you choose the best indicator, it can simply take time that the things you want to have happen. Also, and if there are questions, I'm happy to answer. Can they be connected or normally they cannot be connected? Um, 
there should be a little bit distance in between to, to avoid that you have an influence from un, one reach to the other reach or so. That is, and, and typically, um, you should have your reference side upstream of the measure side because with the measure, you, you modify things and you increase, for example, during the construction phase, the turbidity or so, and that will influence the downstream sides. So you should have the, the measure upstream. And, and one thing also that I did not mention so far, um, if you apply more taxa or so and more indicators at the same side, start always with the fish. Not because these are my favorites or so, but at the same side, um, you can sample fish first without influencing the invertebrates at this side also and also not the macrophytes also. And then you start with the invertebrates also and sample those and the macrophytes, they are not so flighty. They will even not disappear also from these sites. They are still there. You can, can count the trees in the floodplain also later on or so it will not interfere. The other way around, if you uh, go through and, and wrap the macrophyte, um, take the macrophytes or so identify the macrophytes or if you are wading around, fish are mobile and flighty and still the, the largest individuals are there gone from the area before you start the fishing. So start with the fishing invertebrates, macrophytes or so and use the upstream reference sites. Yes. With fish, don't you have the risk to have like in a meta community, pers meta community perspective, to have a mass, uh, mass uh, effect. Because in microinvertebrates, generally, when we recover in a large river, we cannot see any recovery. Because uh, the point that is recovered normally feels the point, the other that is not restored. So I think the fish, don't you think that is probably even this, the mass effect can, it, can generally, do you see that it? it avoid you to see a recovery or the fish are not mobile as so far as that. That's why I ask you yeah. if the reach are connected or not. The, 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 the fish are mobile also and, and even independent uh, on, on the connection uh, you potentially have there, there will be some connection because you need uh, also for your new habitat or so for your rehabilitation stretch you need somewhere to have the fish in the system that they are still able to migrate to your site to, to respond. Also you need a fauna population somewhere there also and, and then it, we cannot exclude that the fish will also move to the reference site also but that's uh, the principal idea behind all these habitat samples also if you provide a habitat what is really preferred by a species also, then the chance to catch the species there also and also the density of the species there will be higher. That's, that's the principle behind. But it does not exclude this species from other sites. And, and, and to be honest, it has to be there already also under suboptimal conditions or under deteriorated condition to have a rehabilitation potential. If a species is not there, it cannot respond.